on a Thursday evening at you know and and uh, for the team for organizing this and uh, just in case okay maybe just introduce myself Patrick Tay Assistant Secretary General of the NTUC the owner of the premises that you are in here right now <laughs> in case you're wondering why uh, the, the union movement and the labor movement or NTUC for short is partnering uh, the data science community we happen to like bump to each other and uh, not just virtually but literally with Vich and the team so I I, 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 I told my colleagues we, we actually have a UPME center right here in uh, NTC building. That's why we gave you all a, a one piece collateral for you to get an idea of what we're doing. The NTC labor movement has been like championing causes and really um, trying to help fellow professionals, managers, executives. And we are particularly interested in the, in the data science community uh, for one reason because we know that this industry is growing very, very, very greatly. Uh, why? How do we know that? Because uh, of our feelers, our sensors with various com com uh, industries and various companies. So we know, in including the financial sector. Besides the UPME Centre, the Financial Industry Career Advisory Centre is also located, co-located with the UPME Centre. We know data science and data analytics is a very big, big thing. In fact, just a couple of months back, we had a data analytics uh, kind of um, expert series right here in this auditorium where we got uh, uh, some well-known names to talk about data analytics and there, were, there was quite an incredible turnout. It's about more than 200 people turned up in, in short notice without any advertising. And uh, we, we know that this industry is very big and, and uh, we wanted to touch base with the community. So that's where we, 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 we decided let's incubate and, and, and seed this community. So therefore, we are uh, just the venue sponsor. We are not experts in data science, but uh, we hope to see this community thriving and doing well because uh, we know that uh, uh, this community is one where they, they will provide lots of jobs and exciting uh, uh, space to work with because we are look looking at future jobs, we are looking at uh, future work uh, for the future workforce. So we were glad to be able to partner and do a, do a small thing to incubate this and we hope you enjoyed the session this evening. And again, uh, on behalf of the Labour Movement and NTUC, we welcome all of you for spending this evening and later hearing Adam uh, rattle off in the next couple of hours. With that, thank you very much and have a great evening. All right. All right. Um, so I'm being told to change a resolution, I guess? Pardon me for a second. Um, What resolution did you want it? What resolution? 720? Okay. Um. <laughs> Are you sure? Does that work? Good? Okay. Thanks. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so uh, I'm Adam, the co-founder and CTO of SkyMind. Uh, so SkyMind was one of the first deep learning startups. We started it in 2013 uh, in San Francisco where all this kind of uh, started happening with Google and Facebook and all that. Uh, so deep learning hype machines kind of taken off at this point and what we decided to do was you know what I'm gonna take deep learning and I'm gonna go that way so what we did was we decided we're not gonna do Python we're gonna do Java because at the end of the day that's that's what most production systems are written in uh, data science teams also have data engineering teams and those are the guys who hold the keys to the cluster so we went after that market uh, so what you're gonna hear today is mainly oriented towards how do I deploy deep learning uh, what are the problems that are going to be involved if you decide to do this? Uh, you're, you know, you, you hear enough about the math, 
You hear enough about you know, the hype. You hear about loss functions. There's whole textbooks on, on just gradient descent. Uh, so what I want to do today is maybe talk about something that's not uh, covered as much, which is how do I use this today? And if so, what's it like? And what do I do with it? Um, so I'm going to try to keep this as framework neutral as possible. Uh, you know, the lessons, uh, you know, take, take some of the lessons for me today is, you know, my opinion of Python is kind of, it's not a good language for production, but great for prototyping. So I'm very, disclosure, I'm very biased in that respect. Uh, so if you have any questions as far as, you know, what's on Spark, why Java, I can answer those questions at a later date. But what I'm going to talk about today is deep learning as it relates to hardware acceleration, production deployments, and data engineering. Um, so one of the things that, uh, one of the things you might want to know that is you, know, you need data engineers before you need data scientists. Because you need somebody who installs the cluster. Uh, so you need to set up, so what I see at these organizations is the, the first tires of data scientists typically are data scientists and data engineers. So I think Singapore is going to have a very fundamental uh, cold start problem. Uh, so some of you are going to need to learn Java. Uh, so a subsidy you might use us, I don't know. But uh, yeah, as I said, most of the lessons should be pretty generalizable, data pipelines, C++, uh, things like that. So, so if you have, but we're also going to do at the end, we're just going to have uh, intro to deep learning. Like what are the questions you have? You know, you know, so we can talk about the Python frameworks as well. Um, so I'm, I'm very open to that. How do I tackle this problem? Anything that you're open to, uh, let me know. Uh, so with that, we'll start. So today, uh, I'm going to talk about the software I created, Deep Learning 4J. Uh, so it's been around for quite a few years now. Um, so it's, it, it, was built, it was mainly built for Hadoop and Spark. Uh, so in this case, so one of the things I'm going to start saying is we programmed in Java, but Java is slow. So, so Hadoop, Kafka, all that stuff, yeah, it's not bad. But it's great at, Java is great at talking to pipes. It's great at setting up file systems and commun, oops, communicating across nodes. But it can't do C++. It can't do hardware acceleration. So one of the appeals of Python is it's, it's a great systems language for connecting to linear algebra. So NumPy, everybody uses that. Fiano, TensorFlow, they all have kind of these underlying C++ bindings, right? So one of the things, but the, the problem with that is you can't deploy that to, you don't deploy that to production. You might be a startup, maybe you deploy to the cloud. That's most of you and that will be most of you. So enthusiasts, good, it's good enough for I'd say the 90%. But if you have on-prem clusters with existing infrastructure, that's all gonna be, that's typically gonna be Java based. Um, and you know, in this case with deep learning, you know, something like PySpark isn't good enough. So if you guys use Spark, uh, you probably use PySpark and you probably do it in Jupyter or your IPython notebook if you even use Spark. Uh, but, but at the end of the day, Python as a language con connects to something written in Java. So our, so our thing was, well, why should that be a bottleneck? Why not just have it straight in Java and then apply the same lessons from Python? So in this case, that's, so that, that, that's C++ oriented then. So one of my engineers, and I'll, I'll get into it later, wrote something called what I'll call the Cython for Java. So Cython is a high level, it's a high level framework for writing uh, C code in Python. And then what it does is it actually generates Python code or C code. And you know, it has static typing and all that. It has compilation. And then it actually com kind of compiles down to static, you know, an actual binary. Uh, so that's what allows Python to be fast in some respects. So one of the, another framework you might want to look into is Numba, N-U-M-B-A. Uh, so that's, that's, another, that's another attempt at doing that very same thing. Um, so, so you need C++, you need C code. Um, so Python is good enough for most things in that respect. Um, so one of the reasons we chose Java though was most systems are written in Java that we found, like, you know, at least in industry. I mean, you know, you might be Google where you have, where maybe you created the concept of Google file system, and the, but the rest of the industry uses Hadoop file system. Right, so at the end of the day, that's what you're going to find. That's what's been out there for the last 10 years. That's what companies have, and that's what they use. Um, so we oriented it toward, we or oriented some of this, you know, kind of this harder technology towards existing deployments that can run today. But we removed some of the bottlenecks of, well, there's this GIL thing, global interpreter lock in Python. You know, you can't do, you can't actually do multi-threading. 
you have to it, you actually have to dive down into C to do anything fast in Python. So Java Java is actually 80% as fast as C on its own. So it's great for writing stable systems code that's statically typed. And there's a lot of distributed systems infrastructure, Kafka, Elasticsearch, uh, Spark, all that stuff's JVM based, right? So that's kind of that's kind of the core lessons here that I would uh, that I would take from this. So in our case, we still rely on CUDA, right? You know, so we still we, we also have CPU. You know, we, we do stuff with Intel. We're using MKL, so you don't need CUDA, but you can use MKL. You can use you know CPUs if and that you know honestly that's probably what's going to be installed on your cluster. Your 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 boss probably doesn't know what a GPU is, and he doesn't know he needs one. Uh, so. That, no, I mean, it's true, right? You know, if you think about it, you know, why, you know, your boss, your boss is going to be like, what's the ROI here? It's faster for this deep learning thing. But we're doing, we are not even doing deep learning. Well, I want to do deep learning. We need GPUs. So you have this, you have this cold, you have this actual political cold start problem uh, when you're, when you're actually trying to build these clusters. So you run your proof of concept on Amazon, but then it still takes a couple of days to train and you still don't know what's going on. And it's really hard for them to understand why they need this. And then on top of that, well, what's this deep learning thing? Why do we need it? You know, so you have, so you can't really set up a good uh, production deep learning environment because even just politics. What's a GPU? Why do I need it? So that's why we run on, you know, that's why we tried to target CPUs and GPUs. And then when, we, when, you know, when they, when they deploy it and they get a good, you know, good taste of it, then, you know, then they can start thinking about, well, okay, maybe this, I'll buy one GPU. No, we need four. What, a Titan X? What's that? You know, you have this. You know, you, you have this you have this increasing budget that goes towards more hardware once you get deep, you know once you get deep learning involved. Uh, so you have to pick the right problem uh, as well. But so one of the things we decided was, well, you know, let's target the ops guys who actually run the the clusters. Those guys know how to configure Hadoop clusters. I can go in I can go in and speak their language, right? So I'm not the Python data scientist. I'm the guy who actually touches the production code, right? So we go to those people. You know, so what we assume is you, you've already prototyped something in AWS and Python. You know, you use TensorFlow, you use Theano, whatever. And, and you, you probably actually, uh, the framework I would recommend for just getting started with deep learning is actually a framework called Keras, K-E-R-A-S. It's a higher level abstraction over TensorFlow and Theano. Um, so if you're gonna prototype something, use Keras. Um, Francois Cholet, the creator of Keras, actually has a Manning book coming out later this year, or next year, I think. So. Uh, so there's there's a lot of getting started materials now. Most of them are in Python, and so you can do most of this on your own. Um, that being said, you're going to have trouble deploying this though, because your data engineers when they go to when they go to run this stuff in Java and Scala, they're going to be like, what's the what's the production version of this? You know, you're you're unless you're like just a small startup, you're probably not going to be running. You know, you're probably going to have a data engineering team, and they're going to want to know. You know, I want something in Java. Where is it? So that's typically the audience we go for, uh, if that makes sense. So that being said, you need C++, uh, but there's, problem, there's problems with hardware acceleration and all sorts of other things that you, you, just may, you, know, might, you might not be thinking about. So if you, if you take any lessons from me today, it's figure out how to navigate the politics in your organization to get a small GPU cluster. That will take time. Uh, that being said, you know, start prototyping now. Start using the cloud. It's out there. You can do it today. It's not that bad. Tuning, you know, the, the biggest part of deep learning is tuning. You know, because you know, at the end of the end, at the end of the day, DL4j in this case, you know, uses a JVM, but we still follow the same constructs as Python: computation graphs, you know, data flow, you know, flow of matrices through a neural network. We still do this. We still do the exact same thing. Uh, Python had such good ideas that I ported them to Java. Uh, so that's kind of what. So I ported NumPy to Java, and that's kind of what we use at the core for our algorithms. So you, a lot of the concepts still apply. So the current landscape, though, so right now, so one of the problems is Spark is bad. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to call everything terrible tonight. Everything is bad and the world is going to end. Uh, so one of the things is, uh, so, so, computer, so deep learning mainly works on images. That's what everybody starts with. But Spark assumes this SQL abstraction. So it assumes Spark SQL, select star, and you get an RDD back, or a data frame, or, oh, oh no, it's a data set. So it'll probably be data something. I don't know what it is, but you know they have this. Um, you know they're gonna whatever the next abstraction is. They're gonna have uh, they're gonna have some representation of a distributed data set. But right now, that's typically it typically requires SQL to get up and running. Um, you can't do SQL on pixels. So you know so uh, 
pixels, like images are just, it's, it's three, by, three by five by five or whatever, right? It's a tensor, right? You know, so it's a multi-dimensional data structure that has random numbers in them called pixels. So I take a picture of this room and there's red and there's all sorts of colors. I can't do SQL on that. What do you do? You know, so you need, so there's a lot of, so we actually use, for our stuff, we use OpenCV. So we actually integrated OpenCV into Spark. So you can load image, you, so you can use the same stuff that other people do, but again, you can use them in Java, you can use them in Spark. Um, so if that makes sense. So the current landscape is most things just aren't, most mainstream tools just are not set up for deep learning. So let me see. So, so I mentioned binary, let's see. So the other thing is, uh, is actually uh, HDFS has a great, has a great byproduct. It's actually great at storing binary data. So, so what, what you'll find is that uh, some, some, some random organizations have terabytes upon or petabytes of video footage and they're storing it in Hadoop. They don't know what to do with it though. You know, so, but, so the, where they're storing the data, they don't know how to use it, right? So, so they don't know how to analyze it. So, you're gonna, so you'll use neural nets for that, but then it's really hard to connect to where the data is actually stored. So what do you do there? You can't use Spark because, again, SQL and pixels. So what are you left with here? So, the, so there, there was a lot of tools we had to write for ourselves in order to make this kind of palatable for the, 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 guy, the Hadoop admin, that guy, the guy who holds your, the keys to your cluster, right? So there's a lot of things we had to do to make this suitable for, for, for that audience. Um, but so that's actually a problem with Python and, uh, Python and Spark is, you know, when, you, when you're trying to access data, all, Python, a lot, of the, a lot of the image libraries and things like that assume data is local. So scikit-learn, images, they, it all assumes everything's local. So it's hard, to, it's hard to connect to Hadoop. That being said, uh, Wes McKinney at Cloudera, uh, he's now at Cloudera, so the creator of Pandas works for a Hadoop company. Oh, oh God, you know. <laughs> you know that, but his, his sole job is actually kind of cool. Wes McKinney is a great Python advocate, but he's actually a C guy. He does most of his coding in C. So he's actually a systems programmer whose sole job is to make Python and Java interop fast via C++. So he knows Cython, the underlying C Python, and he knows Java native interface. And he's making those two, he's making those two things talk to each other via C. So he's, he's making interop with the Hadoop ecosystem on Python easier. So, so I, I took the opposite approach and I said, there's no hope for Python. Cloudera, Cloudera did the opposite thing and said, well, you know, people use Python so let's just make, let's just invest in making it easier to connect to Hadoop. So there's, there's cool things happening that I think is going to make a, I, I think there's going to be a convergence. Like I, I think I, it probably won't matter what tool you're using in the next year, you know, in the next couple of years. If that's the case, well, there it is. But, you know, at the end of the day, a lot of these underlying problems are still going to need to go away. What's a GPU? Why do I need to store that data? How do I load data? How do I load data from my cluster? How do I do that? Um, you know, those questions are usually roll it yourself. And that's, at the end of the day, that's still time spent, right? So, you know, so if you're going to get paid to do deep learning and not, and not have it be research, you need to make it practical. So you need to think about loading the data. You need to think about how do we make it fast? How do I make it, the, how do I make this palatable to the guy who, or tolerable to the guy who runs my cluster? Right, so there's, there's multiple things involved there. So if you're gonna get your organization involved in deep learning, find a use case, prototype it yourself, prove it works, take that to your boss, and then try to figure out how to deploy it. So at least at the very minimum, you gave yourself an, uh, an excuse to do something really cool for a couple of weeks. You know, so you can, try to, you can try to see if you can get into it. So, so what I would suggest is start with Python, get in the cloud, and then, and, then, and then start from there. When you're ready to deploy to production, call me. <laughs> Um, but well, no. But seriously, it depends on the scale, though. Like you might, you know, you might not need uh, Java at you know, you might not need Java at scale. A thousand Python servers might be fine. You know, people people tend to rewrite things from Python to Go or Java when it's an actual bottleneck. Uh, so that ha that happens with larger companies, but it it varies. You know, enthusiasts aren't going to need to do that. You know, so there's a very subset of there's a very small subset of the audience uh, that would that would likely do this. So, so the solution, so the solution we kind of proposed was again this this idea of Siphon for Java. 
So we said, well, you know, so kind of like how Wes McKinney is making via, via C code is actually making the Python and Java interop faster. Um, we just, again, we just said, we just did the reverse and just said, well, you know, there's already, you know, we already have this Java CPP thing. Java, we already have, we, you know, we have the Java bindings for Cafe, TensorFlow, and all these other things already in Java CPP. So we have the tool. So we wrapped all the, all the, all the, all the C code the Python people use, we wrap that in Java. So we have that too. Um, so, you know, so it's possible to run, you know, straight Java and Scala if you, if you want to try it. You know, so we have a lot of, so if you're going to learn, if you want to be adventurous though, you try, don't learn Java, learn Scala. That, that's, that's a little more, it's a little newer. And well, and, and honestly, it, it's closer to Python. So like the C code or the, the, the Scala code rewrite is very close to Python. Uh, but you get static typing for free, which is kind of nice. So the other thing is uh, we actually made we actually made image storage easier. So 64 bit so 64 bit indexing. What does that mean? That means that I can have a large contiguous block of memory as an image, and I can just send that all straight to the GPU. That means we can store larger data structures than is normally possible in Java. So we don't we actually for all of our stuff we have this concept of off heap memory. So off heap memory basically means we don't rely on Java's memory model. We do our own garbage collection. We have our own, uh, we have our own GC and everything built into the system. We do this for CUDA as well. So we actually, we actually ma manage memory on the GPU and you don't have to know what, you don't have to know what malloc and free are. We do that for you. Um, and th this all happens passively. Um, so, so in this case, so the, the, the lesson here is again, think about storage. Think about loading, think about the fundamentals of computer science. Loading data from disk is slow. Having things in RAM is fast. You know, that, that actually matters for training time. You know, so there's things like, you know, especially for something like mini batch learning. You know, when you have a small, com you know, when you have just a laptop and you, you, you have, you know, you're training on images, you're not gonna be able to load all that into RAM at once. You know, you're gonna have, you know, you might have 16 gigs of RAM in your laptop, right? You're not gonna be able to load all that in at once, right? So in this case, having efficient data structures for storing, you know, these mini batches, you, you know, these batches of images is actually good. Um, so. Python can't do so. Python can't quite do this. Uh, C, C is C is low level and flexible enough. However, let me see. But and then and then from that though, you know, once once we have more efficient storage, then we can leverage uh, what Java is good at, which is storing stuff. You know, so there's very fast databases written in Java. Presto, Cassandra, Elasticsearch. These are all things written in Java that are great at storing uh, binary data, right? So these things do exist. Uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes it is C code as well, but Java in, in practice has been fast enough for distributed systems, like distri actual distributed systems code you write, the thing that connects your cluster together. Like that stuff, that stuff's typically written in Java and is already fairly good at storing data. You know, so the thing, the thing there we need to think about is then just being able to access that data in some way. So the other thing though is, Again, Java is not uh, Java is not Python. So Python, the reason it took off is it's kind of close to MATLAB. You know, you, you have these ND array things. You have these uh, you know this you have this pandas thing. You know, and it makes it you know it, it's it, it's it's very concise, right? And and you have you know you have decade you have about a decade of code for scientific computing written in Python and that connects to C. That's NumPy, right? So. Java didn't have that, unfortunately, so we had to create it. Um, so we did that because, again, I believed in this, you know, giving, you know, giving access, giving low level access to like Cindy instructions and, you know, you know, the, the latest, the latest hardware accel technique, acceleration techniques. I believed in giving that, ac you know, giving people access to that in Java. Um, so that's something Python already had. So we had to create that ourselves. So that's called libindy4j. It's just a pure C++ code base. That's all it is. Um, you know, we're benchmarking, you know, we, because of that, it's actually kind of cool. We actually get to benchmark on DGXs. So I have an NVIDIA supercomputer and I also have the latest CPUs from Intel, the night, la the night's landing stuff. I, I get, I actually have my hands on the stuff you read about, uh, because we're, because we, we, we do this kind of C++ optimization ourselves. So there's some neat benefits. So if you haven't figured it out yet, the bulk of SkyMine is actually, we're actually a systems company. Most of our most of our people are actually Java and C systems engineers who happen to know machine learning, and actually this is this is actually true of a lot of the research labs. A lot of the research labs, until they hit scale, kind of like data engineers are your first hires for your your data science cluster. It's actually very similar. So GPU programmers are typically the first hires for research labs. 
So actually, Andrew Ng, when he start, was starting the Baidu Research Lab, was only hiring systems programmers. Because the thing he said was, the machine learning is teachable. Distributed systems is not. So this, distributed systems is kind of the hard part of this. You know, especially distributed linear algebra. I mean, that's esoteric. You're only going to use that for deep learning. <laughs> you know, so it's, it's, a, it's definitely a very strange set of skills to have. So if you have those things, uh, go get paid in the States. You're probably going to make a lot of money. <laughs> um, I mean, that being said, like, you know, governments are starting to use this kind of stuff. But again, it's a very specialized set of skills that you need to hire for. Um, let me see. What time was I supposed to go till? 8.30? Okay. Yeah. All right. That's, that's about right. I'm going to leave about probably 20 minutes for questions. Um, so this is kind of what a, this looked weird. Uh, this was not anticipated. This is our, uh, so this is, this is a, this is what a production stack kind of looks like. This is, this is at least our interpretation of this. So what you'll see is you'll have, you have all this kind of, uh, the, you know, the, all these data sources under here. You have relational databases. So think about, actually, just, just think about your job for a second. You have MySQL. You probably have some Postgres in there because somebody got adventurous. You probably have a Hadoop cluster. That probably uses Cassandra or, HD, you know, some, you know, some HDF, you know, HBase or one of the other databases. You probably have about 10 databases you use. You, don't, you probably only know about one, but you actually have 10. Your whole, your whole company probably has about 10 or 20 different databases they use. So there's a lot of fragmentation and all sorts of different data sources. Um, so one, of, you know, so one, one, one great example of this is Twitter. So Twitter has, Twitter has lots of teams. Hello? What happened? Well, okay, so Twitter has lots of teams. I can broadcast too. Uh, so Twitter has lots of teams, right? So think about that for a second. So you have 20 teams. Each of them has an opinion about a technology, right? You know, you you know, you guys, you guys probably have your favorite. You guys probably have your favorite stack. You know, all of you has a favorite web framework. All of you has a favorite database, and they all know how to kind of. They, you all know how to kind of use those things, and those different teams. Like, and then those teams know word one thing, but then when they go to work with another team, they're like, "What's going on here?" You know, that that's actually why a lot of companies uh, force everything to just force everything to be APIs. Um, no. Oh, Sorry. there it goes. Okay. Um, okay. So that's why that's why these companies. That's like I like this better. Uh, so that's actually why these companies force everything to be APIs. So what is it? so so th this uh, this start, this started with Amazon. So Jeff Bezos decided. Jeff Bezos said to every manager in in Amazon, "I'm going to fire all of you unless you make everything APIs." That's what created Amazon Web Services. I'm serious. So that's how, because they had, they had a long lag on engineering, on, on engineering time because integrating different teams is difficult. So they just said, everybody's gonna speak JSON, done. You know, so that kind of solved, that kind of solved some problems. But that doesn't, uh, the problem there is, that doesn't happen in Hadoop. So big data systems uh, typically have one central data source, which is HDFS. And, and so the, the problem has moved from Okay, now we have all these web services talking to each other, but now we have all the data in Hadoop. What do we do? You know, so that's what a lot of people are asking themselves. There's a lot of benefits to having one Hadoop cluster. Some people have multiple, but at the end of the day, like, you're not usually going connect, to connect to multiple Hadoop clusters. You might connect to different, you know, two different HBase instances on the same Hadoop cluster, but all of it's kind of stored in, this, in, the, in the same data source. Right, so you have, but you still have, uh, so this has actually caused a lot of fragmentation. So you actually ended up with the same problems that people had. Think about it. So, so again, like, just remember Amazon, right? You know, they had all these different web, web product teams that, you know, they tried using each other's libraries and people rewrote code and, you know, chaos everywhere, right? So this is actually still happening in new. It's just, the problem is, is there's, there's dedicated teams called data engineers that kind of just, they kind of take care of that. So, so there's a big focus on kind of data governance. So what do I mean by that? I mean, say, you know, validating data input, you know, watch, you know, keeping an eye on the storage and things, things of that nature, right? So, so but, uh, but the, the interesting thing about machine learning is, you know, you have all these different data sources together, right? 
And you know, you're actually unifying things that you normally wouldn't. So for example, customer, let's just think about ad tech. So let's just, or actually no, just a general problem of customer service. If I want to know the state of a customer, can your company answer that today? Can I say for this individual customer, across our call logs, like our, our interactions with calling this person, their web activity on their login, and the support chat, you know, the you know, where they're they're typing text. You know, the customer probably uses all of those things depending on where they're at, you know, what time of day it is and everything else. And they're just expecting the company behind the scenes to take care of that for them. In reality, in, in, internally, you're like, oh God, you know, you're, you're the guy who has to go out and collect all the data, aggregate it in a way, and then, and then, and then, and then your boss just tells you, just build a machine learning uh, model that understands our customers, go. And then you're like, how do I do that? Right, so, you know, so, so what, you get, what you end up having to do is actually connect all these data sources together. So that's one of the things, that's actually one of the things we're good at, is figuring out how to do that. That's, so that's actually why we did that in Java, because you know, Pipe, you know, that's actually why we did it in an integrated way, because the, a lot of the problem with Python libraries is, how many of you, you know, probably written like Python, you know, pandas scripts that are 200 lines long, that collect data from different data sources, and then maybe there's a CSV in there, and, and then you have to like filter, and then you map, and then, uh, you know, you're, you're, and then, and then you look in at the end of the day, and it's a ball, it's a, it's a ball of code, and you're wondering where did this come from? It, and it came from you incrementally saying, run this SQL query, get back data. Oh, right, oh crap, I made a mistake. Get data again, and, and then, and do that filter, then do that transform. Then you know, then you end up with this gigantic pen of script, and you're like, what's going on here? You're confused because it's hard to, it's hard to track all these transforms. And you, in half the time, actually, you don't even document why you did that transform. You forgot. Everybody, everybody does that. You know, so that's actually one of the things we wrote is something called DataVac. Its sole job is just, and, and we cover this. I'm, oh, so I'm an O'Reilly author, and I'm selling my book right now. So my book just dropped today. So if you want to talk about you know end-to-end -end stuff, this is all covered in my book. 440 pages. Uh, it's online. <laughs> Um, but no, I mean that being said, I mean one of the things that's great about static typing is it actually kind of makes it easier to do. It actually makes it tolerable to work with. So when you have messy data, at least it's statically typed. At least the compiler can tell you you're doing something stupid. In Python, you'll get a random error at one time. How many how, how many times does that happen? You don't get a compiler error. Uh, can't parse two string two. Well, why? Oh, oops. And then you run it again. You know that that's um. That's actually why a lot of that's actually why a lot of large scale systems are kind of written in Java because at the end of the day a lot of these things are messy, right? So yeah, Java's verbose. You know, scale is not too bad, but you know, at the end of the day, at least the compiler takes care of some of this stuff for you. Um, so this is an actual cluster, though. This is an actual. This is this would be an actual cluster. So one of the things that uh, one of the things that, that's not mentioned here is actually just GPUs, though. You know, so I'll I'll, I'll show. I'll show a couple more kind of pictures that, that you got that, that might help you navigate this a little bit. But actually, underneath all this is the chip, the chip itself. So you know you have your you have your disk and you have all your data sources here. But then you you know in here you'll have a mix of CPUs and GPUs. Uh, so that so th th that's what clusters will probably look like in a couple years. You know you'll actually have to start thinking about what's at the chip level. What chip am I using? What am I deploying to? That that's actually why there's a there's a project you should know about called Apache Mesos. Apache Mesos is, it's, it's a resource manager. Apache Mesos was actually, uh, Apache Spark was actually a sub-project of Mesos. Spark was actually a proof of concept for Mesos. So Mesos now has billion dollar, you know, they're, they're a billion dollar company and I think they have, they have a significant portion of investment from Microsoft because they power a lot of Microsoft data centers now. Um, but Mesos, Mesos added GPU support. So it actually, so this resource manager actually has the ability to say, I'm going to submit a job to my cluster, and I want, I, I need at least one GPU. So, so GPUs are starting to propagate. Kubernetes. I don't know. If, I don't know. How, you guys probably aren't on the, on, on the container hype train, but there's a thing called Kubernetes, and it basically it controls Google's resources. So if you've heard of Docker, you probably use Docker on your laptop, and you just played around a little bit, maybe. You're like, cool, Linux on Docker, ah, in, in Mac, yeah, you know. It's, it's, it's a lightweight VM, or it's not actually a VM, that's another story though. But you have this thing called Kubernetes, and again, they, they also added GPU support. So a lot of people are actually looking at GPUs as a way of saying, well, we know, we know this deep learning thing exists, and 
we need we need better compute. So we'll we'll make it easier to do. So so th that it has real industry traction. It's still very nascent though. It's still very new. Um, but you know it's starting to come out. So you'll you'll start thinking about you're going to start thinking about the chip soon. Maybe not now. You know, in a couple of years, you'll be thinking about the chip. That's my job now. Is I think about the chip. We help, we help kind of companies navigate that. Um, you know, so no one thinks about how do I connect the the data, the storage, to the compute. How do I connect the Hadoop file system to a GPU? That's a very esoteric problem, but that's something that that's something that a lot of companies have asked. You know, IBM being one of them. IBM has asked that question. So we don't. Um, I work with IBM Tokyo, Switzerland, and a couple of uh, the US. Uh, we work with the Spark Technology Center. So we do a lot of stuff with different parts of IBM because they, have, they ask that question. How do I take an RDD and compile, it, compile kind of the, the binary, rep the, the, the byte code representation, the Java byte code to CUDA code? How do I do that? So they asked that question and actually created something. Um, so this, this is starting to come up. Um, you know, we, NVIDIA has asked us that same question. What do we do with Spark? We know we keep running in this big data thing. We don't know what to do with it. We're a chip company. Uh, Intel, same problem. So Intel has been investing in, you know, they've invested in data artisans. That's the company behind Flink. Flink is kind of a competitor to Spark, mainly focused on real-time applications. Uh, kind of cool. So similar API to Spark, but, but better in all respects. Um, so, yeah, we heavily, Spark has a lot of traction. But what you'll typically see is you'll, you'll typically, you start seeing Flink uh, for like ad tech and other streaming use cases. You typically see the two side by side because they both use Hadoop. So people, the, 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 the takeaway is, is that the, the JVM people are continuing to innovate. Some of them are doing it in Scala, but it's a thing. You know, the Java ecosystem is still evolving. So you're still going to see data stored here. So the best streaming infrastructure in the world is still JVM based. You know, a lot of, um, you know, for example, Samsung's IoT platform. That's all. That's actually all Scala. So a lot of a lot of IoT platforms, especially the cloud the cloud side of that, is all JVM based. So they use the actor model. They use streaming. Like that's all. Job, that's actually all Java based. Uh, so you'll 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 still see that. So you're still going to have this problem of well, deep learning seems to be more accurate for certain problems. But again, how do we connect this JVM thing to this to this GPU thing? So you know that that's actually what I predicted would happen a couple years ago when I started all this was. People are going to want to do it on Hadoop at some point. I don't know when. They're going to want to do it at some point. They're going to want to take this to production. So what do we do about that? And that's kind of where that's kind of where I'm at now because a lot of um, well, here's the thing. I mean, a lot of things start in Python, and a lot of the frameworks are still in Python now. Um, so so now like so now the the thing here is how do I use it at my job today, right? So that's kind of the, that's kind of the question I think a lot of people are still trying to answer for themselves. So I'll just skip a lot of this, I think. I think I've already kind of covered. So streaming frameworks. Oh, one of the things I'll, uh, one of the things I'll mention. So I'm going to trash talk a little bit. So Google, Google put out this thing called TensorFlow Serve written in Python. These are real streaming frameworks, people. <laughs> so these are, this, is, this is what you're actually going to use. When you're not on AWS, on your small hobby instance, you're going to use something like this. So this is, you're going to use Kafka. You're going to use Flink. I mean, even Spark Streaming. Spark Streaming is kind of slow. You know, the micro batch thing. If you're curious about distributed systems or you care about this stuff, feel free to ask. I can rant all day. Um, but most streaming frameworks, though, are they're typically done in in Java. So what I'll say is, the Py there, there's something I like to call Python Island. Most people are going to stay on Python Island. It's a great vacation spot. You know, it's warm. There's you know, it's easy to prototype things. But then, when you want to go to when you want to go to enterprise, when you want to actually go in and deploy this, where your boss actually hits the approve button, and you're in a large organization that deploys Hadoop, or Spark, or what have you, you know you're going to have to get off of Python Island. A lot of things, a lot of things, a lot of people on Python Island stay there. So this is um, so this these trees, this 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 pretty island, those are those buildings are each universities. So this is a lot of innovation happens on Python Island. But you know, so Python Island's a great vacation spot. It's the Bahamas, right? You know, it's the Bahamas of data science because you go there, everything's pretty. There's libraries for everything. But when you try to write, write you know, imagine trying to write on a 100,000 line code base in Python. Imagine trying to actually, you know, and then having something break on you at runtime rather than compile time because you forgot to add a uh, add a add a string or something. 
you know, the, there's a reason static typing still kind of dominates most of the web. And actually, the, that's actually why a lot of JavaScript developers have moved to TypeScript or something similar to that. Because they don't, they don't want to deal with dynamic typing, you know, because it, it is error prone, right? So prototype on Python Island, take a vacation, uh, and then when you're ready, when you're ready to start thinking about deploying this stuff, you're going to have to think about the systems. You know, you're going to have to avoid, you know, you're going to have to think about how do I avoid running out of RAM on my laptop or on, on my cluster? How do I avoid blowing up a machine and not having the ops guy call me? I'm like, what are you doing? This, this looks interesting. Should I shut this down? You know, you don't want to get that call. You don't want to talk to your ops guy. Your ops guy is angry. <laughs> you don't want to talk to him. Because if he's calling you, you broke something. <laughs> just remember that. So it's just, it's just something to think about. Um, so um, anything I'm missing here? Oh, I guess uh, one thing I'll mention at the bottom. Uh, so we imitated NumPy. Uh, go ahead and take go ahead and take take a screen uh, a picture of the buzzwords if you want. But the bottom there is Spark friendly. So one of the things that uh, a lot of people still haven't thought about is how do we run this on multiple threads? So what does that mean exactly? How do we do multi-threading? Remember, Python doesn't do multi-threading. It doesn't actually do it doesn't actually do multi-threading. Um, typically, it's handled for you in C at some point. But you know, at the end of the day, if you're gonna one of the things we did was we actually we actually took a lot of the existing uh, C++ mechanics and made those manageable from Java. So that includes multi-GPU and a lot of the other fancy buzzwords that uh, if you want faster training, we just give you all the knobs and we, you can do it straight from Java. Just kind of interesting, actually. Um, so deployment, um, you know, so we just kind of, this is for training. We run as a Spark job. We're just a Spark jar. Just, you can build it locally. We don't rely on Spark, but when you want to do kind of distributed training, we can do that. Um, all right. So, so, so actually, oh, this, so this, I gave this presentation a while back, but so one of the things we actually have now is reinforcement learning. So we 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 actually taught DL4j how to play Doom. So we actually have uh, ro we actually have robot killing. Uh, I can show you that too later if you want. Um, so it's called RL4j. We actually, over the summer, we actually contributed to Jim, OpenAI Jim, the reinforcement learning environment. We, can, we actually contributed the Java bindings to Jim. So we're gonna, we're actually using, by the way, we're actually using reinforcement learning. There's, there's FinTech use cases, insurance. So just get the word out. There's actually practical applications for reinforcement learning. It's not just games. Um, that being said, um, I will go ahead and, all right, right on time. All right, so I will go ahead and just take any questions you have about deep learning? I've done, I've pretty much touched everything at this point. So, general questions on deep learning. If not, I can talk for, an, I can talk for another 30 minutes. That's, that's not hard for me to do. But I figured I'd open it up to the beginners maybe. Go ahead. Yes, well, uh, so I, I was not completely clear what your uh, distributed numerical uh, algebra framework looks like. Mm -hmm. And also, is it accessible to right? Yeah, it's all Apache. It's all, it's all Apache license. Okay. So, here, so hold on. So, I'm just going to start dropping links now. So, this, so, it's called ND4J. So, this is the, so, this is the C++, this is the, this is the code. So, it looks very similar to, it, so, it looks very similar to, uh, to, to NumPy. So, literally, so we actually have a Scala wrapper called ND4S that wraps this very library and and it's actually all it's actually all it, it actually looks like see it actually looks like python so here we actually have some of the analogies so we have the exact same syndicotic sugar so it looks exactly like python but it's statically typed and then we have and then in that um, and then one of the things we do is we also um, so as I mentioned, we actually ported uh, we ported literally all the concepts from from Python. So we actually even have the same storage mechanisms. So so we actually teach you what tensors are. Uh, so we we made a neat page. This actually maps pretty well to NumPy and MATLAB too. So if you if you just want to learn what a, an ND array is, uh, we there's even a video. There's a video. Play okay. Um, we explain it in 40 seconds. What a what an ND array is. So something to keep in mind. Um, so, um, and then, anyways, the underlying the great thing is the great thing we did was we didn't have to bundle the C++ with uh, the Java project. 
So the, the, the C++ is actually, is actually pretty approachable. So you can, you can actually compile this on your own if you want. Um, one of the things we do, though, is we actually deploy, we actually deploy these binaries to Maven Central for you, the, the pip of Java. So I'll just show you the, so how we do it, so you'll see this ND4j thing, and one of the things you'll see, let me just pull up. So one of the things you'll see is you'll see this Linux PowerPC. We even deploy on IBM servers. Um, you have x86, Mac, and Windows. So we actually compile we actually compile all these C++ things for all the different operating systems. So this you you just download this. You don't have to know how to compile anything in C. You just download it and include it. You're done. Um, so so that that's one of the that's one of my frust that's actually one of my frustrations with the Python ecosystem is compile it from source. Just just do that every time. Update compile from you know so you have to. You have to worry about compilers and all sorts of other crap that you just don't want to deal with, especially when you're just coding in a higher level language. So that, that's one of the things that I'm, I'm glad we actually fixed. We were actually able to fix. Can you show us some of the examples? Sure. So, well, what do you want to? What industry do you want to know about? I've done manufacturing. I've done banking. Okay. Um, well, so, all right. So I will give. Uh, so I, I did a, I did my, I did a, I did another talk uh, earlier actually, that that talk. No, literally, I was presenting to business people, and it was all use cases. Um, so I'll just pull that up real quick. So this was, let me see. Okay, so this was, this was today. So I presented at SunTech, the IoT, the IoT show, and we had, um, so so we had a couple. We had so we talked about. Uh, Kind of what deep learning is. Oh, oh, present. Der. Okay. So, kind of we, we so we kind of talked about what deep learning is. You know, so what would you use it for? So these are different kinds of unstructured data. So images, self-driving cars, face face detection, uh, voice search, for example. Like you know, speaking to your. So one of the coolest things that, that I think will happen in the next couple of years is we're going to start speaking to our phones, and it'll actually understand what we're saying, even with our accents. So that's one of the that's one of the neat areas I think Baidu kind of innovated on was they 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 actually adapted to all the different dialects of Chinese as well as all the different accents as well. Uh, so I think they have the most accurate voice search system in the world right now, uh, just because just because the the reason the the interesting thing was this was use case driven. Most people in China they treat their phone like their friend. They talk to it like their dad. Hey, can you can, can can I get milk? And then somehow milk will get delivered, right? <laughs> I don't know if that actually happens, but um, but it's close. It's pretty close. Uh, what is this? You know, what is the capital of California? Whatever. You know, people people ask those kinds of questions, and that's how they interact with their phone. So Baidu, I think, have the biggest reason to to kind of make Chinese really good. Uh, so so the the best interface is no interface, if that makes sense. So if I'm so if I want pizza, I just pizza, and then it should fall from the sky. I'm just, it's in my hand, right? So that's a smart, that's a, that's a, that's a smart, pre well, it's not a smart home, it's a smart presentation center. <laughs> so that's all going to be, that's all going to be audio driven, if that makes sense. But yeah, the use cases are pretty broad though. Um, you know, so, so time series, this is what we mainly do is, is time series data. So banking, telco, log data, uh, basically, basically anything, you know, if you've ever seen an Apache log and it has a timestamp and an IP, that's what we deal with typically. And it's typically, in, it, we also do machine logs, predicting when your computer is going to break. So data center, data center, and data center, you know, predicting when something's going to break in your data center. Um, this is a lot of the hype stuff. Um, let's see. Okay, so so again, so it's all it's all based on these data types, but it all really depends on the use case that you're looking for. Let me see. So image search is a great example. So this is e-commerce. Right, so one of the cool things about deep learning is it can, since it knows how to kind of pick up its own hidden patterns, uh, it's actually able to come up with kind of a compressed representation of images that you can use for search. So you can you can treat like a basically a neural net activation is like a search query. So that's called transfer learning. So that's that's also actually used in real estate as well. So so Trulia does this. Trulia and Zillow do this for their uh, for their real estate matching. So if you want to find a home like that. Let's just say you have an idea of what's pretty. You can show it. You can show it what's pretty, 
And the machine will say, oh, you like that, okay. You know, so you can speak to a machine better than through pictures rather than through text. Uh, so Pinterest also did this. So they made it so you could highlight like a portion of a picture and only get back images similar to that, similar to the, what you highlighted, not just the whole picture. So image search is one of the probably one of the cooler probably one of the cool, co cooler consumer applications that you could build. Um, so, so again, like e-commerce, e-commerce uses this. Recommendation engines are big. So deep learning, actually, deep learning is used a lot in recommendation engines now. So very similar to ad tech, you know, ad tech using deep learning for ad targeting. Like, oh, I know, I know what you clicked on, and I know your interests are. I'm going to put all that into a neural net, and it and it'll tell me what to click next. It'll tell me what to add to serve you. You can do something similar for recommendations. Um, okay, we already mentioned voice search, personal assistant. So basically everything, every, every sort of, I'm talking to my phone use case is deep learning. So I think every company is doing deep learning for this now. Um, let's see, corny stuff, information, self-driving cars. So one of the neat things about self-driving cars is if you actually decompose the problem, it's actually object recognition, sensors, uh, as well as an aggregation of those things, all all to tell when to stop, how to you know how to speed up. That's all. That's all a combination of a lot of things. So there's a lot of different neural nets in here actually handling the driving. Uh, it, so despite the hype, I know you like I know there's some self-driving car stuff happening in Singapore. Um, actually, let me ask about that. Is it only on restricted roads? Only one zone. Okay, so what? So what that company did was they literally mapped. They probably took pictures of that whole zone. Every in, they probably took pictures of that whole zone inch by inch. So Baidu, Baidu is trying to do something similar. They're trying to um, they're trying to they're trying to build special like self driving zones. Right. So that actually doesn't surprise me. There was actually a, there was a YC startup that launched out of my batch. Actually, we were I was in my combinator um, in winter sixteen. So they they launched out of uh, they launched out of my batch and they were basically just driving around college campuses. So restricted domain self-driving cars is, it's, it's at least a proof of concept, but it's nowhere close to them picking us up from anywhere and driving us anywhere. We're not there yet. But it is mainly deep learning that uh, is kind of driving the uh, adoption of self-driving cars. So sensors, so also being able to predict, oh, you know, at the current speed I'm going, the likelihood I'm gonna crash into something is X. So, so Neural nets and IoT are actually very big. So again, it's, it's time series. So environment stuff. Okay, so automotive has, you know, so NVIDIA's, uh, one of NVIDIA's biggest markets, I can't name their first one, but their second one is automotive. So they work with a lot of the car companies and they, you know, they're, they put GPUs in cars. I think it's mainly the German car makers that they're working with, but they're putting GPUs in cars and they're, they're basically using it for embedded object recognition for you know, collision detection, among other things like that. But it also could be sensor, again, it could also be sensor data. It could also, you know, actually behavior is really good. The interaction with the rider in the car, behavior is really big. Um, drones, you know, drones, yeah. Drones, uh, okay, so we know what drones are used for, surveying, surveillance, uh, annoying people, mostly the latter, um, smart homes, Unlocking your, you know, walking, you know, walking up to your door and an, unlo in a, an unlocking, authentication and security is really big. So that's faces, um, all the people, uh, medical, so detecting cancer, um, you know, finding certain parts of an X-ray and saying, oh, that looks strange, you know. So assisting doctors is pretty big. Uh, automatic machine translation, so Skype. So I know they're. I, there's a lot of hype around it. I haven't actually used it, but the disclaimer, but the, the idea is that you, you speak into Skype and it, 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 it has a neural net for automatically translating the text, the, the voice to text, the translating the text, and then outputting it, you know, generating the appropriate audio. That's all end-to-end -end deep learning. So this stuff does exist. Uh, another thing you can actually do is you can, for most languages, you can actually take a picture of your, with your phone and you can you can you can do automatic uh, automatic translation and OCR. That's again one neural network. That's actually a startup Google buy, just to embed it into their app. Um, music generation. So neural nets are now Beethoven. So you can actually teach it to generate music, which is kind of cool. Um, so there's no really loss function for pretty yet, or I there we we might create one. I uh, 
But you know, at some point, you know, at some point, there there will be a limited amount of creativity neural nets can uh, can can use. So algorithmic music is a kind of it's kind of a cool concept that I a lot of people are a lot of hobbyists are starting to kind of take that on. So there's actually a real application for this called musical information retrieval, though, where you basically like you're searching songs or you're recommending recommending things. So Spotify does a lot of this with they 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 data mine the raw audio and the the music, and then they use that to recommend new songs. Spam. So so. A lot of the machine learning use cases too. So things you thought about, fraud detection, spam, whatever, that's all, it's all pretty typical. Like anything you can use machine learning for, you can use deep learning for. Because deep learning at the end of the day is just a subset of machine learning. So, so it's a subset of machine learning with its own terminology. So in, your case, in, your, in, your, in this case, like you have three or more layers, right, on a neural network. You have, you know, the, the old school 80s version of the neural net was a perceptron that was one layer, or maybe one hidden layer. This is about stacking six, you know, three to seven to ten, ten layer to, to ten layers, and then being able to actually tune a model that, you know, tune a model end to end. So deep learning is just, you know, more more fancy neural networks with uh, that are greater than three layers. Yeah. Uh, supervised or unsupervised. So you can actually use. So there, there's something called an autoencoder that you, you know, can basically on its own. It what it does is it does gradient descent on something called KL divergence. It's a similarity between two probability distributions. And what it can do is it can learn to reconstruct the data. So it starts random, and then it and then it tries to tries to reconstruct it. What it does is it feeds its input back into itself and calculates the difference between the two. And then what it, what you can do is you can actually use that to kind of automatically learn features. So, so that that's so that that's being used in that that's being used alongside like K-means clustering to do automatic clustering of data. So that's that's so it's un it's all gradient descent. There's still loss functions involved, but it's all supervised and unsupervised. It's mainly so most things use backprop and supervised learning though. That's where most of the applications are still. Yeah. Well, so we're going to be, so SkyMine is actually working directly with Francois Cholet, creator of Keras, to create like a common file format. So we, we actually ported, uh, we ported Keras to Scala. So it literally, it looks, so I'm not joking when I say it looks exactly like Keras. Um, so if you just, let me, let me try to pull it up. Actually, um, actually you guys can just, it's not released yet, but I'll show it to you anyways. It's the, we don't have a name for it yet. We, we're, we, we, we literally don't have a name, so we're just calling it this for now. It's not actually going to be this when it's released, though. Um, so, so we have an MNIST example. So this is a ConfNet. This is Scala. So you'll see. So again, it looks exactly like uh, Keras. This is, in, this is on the JVM. So this is built on top of Deep Learning 4J. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to, so, so Francois released those uh, pre-trained models recently. We're going to hook into that for all that infrastructure. And then that wraps Theano and TensorFlow. So that, that essentially gives me access to all that stuff. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to, we're going to host it too. I'm actually going to sponsor like a hosted server where all this stuff runs, where people can just download like a model zoo. We're also going to work on a large scale effort to port all the, anything that's in CAFE to, to Keras, if it's not already. Because Keras already has a big enough community that we can kind of just rely on that. And then we're just going to take that and kind of and host it for people. And then what we want to do is we want to encourage people to, that'll mainly be Francois, because he's a researcher, so he trust, they trust him, <laughs> um, to kind of publish their, you know, publish a neural net in their file format. Because, yeah, the, the, the fragmentation is very large, but, you know, for, you know, Keras already has loaders for CAFE and uh, Torch already. So it shouldn't be hard to, it shouldn't be hard to port everything over. It'll take a little bit of work, but we have incentive to do so because we mainly want to target production systems. So I have every incentive to do this, actually. So event, I'm working on it. Um, you know, actually, so to be fair, there's also, there's also an attempt to create a, like a PMML for neural networks uh, coming out from the OpenCL standards body. They're sort of working on something, but it's not tied to actual implementation, so eh. I, I mean, even AMD is compiling to CUDA now. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs>
Um, so Scala, like at, th at this point, you can just go straight to Scala. Uh, I would recommend that mainly because it's similar. It's similar enough to Python, and that you're, you know, and and honestly, like manipulating data in Scala is a lot more pleasurable than it is in Java. Um, Java, I would say, is for a lot of legacy systems, and in our case, uh, we we trust Java. You know, Java just has a bigger audience, and frankly, I trust. Java. I'm a Java programmer at heart. That's all I've been doing. That's what I've been doing most of my career. Uh, so that, that's a big reason why this is in Java, but um, we're mainly in Java for interop purposes with Clojure and Scala and whatever else wants to use it. Uh, we're, but if we're going to write applications, Java 8's not bad, but you know you, you more or less can just go with Scala. Yep. So. Okay, so we have um, a guy from Red Hat uh, actually contributed, actually is going to contribute Flink integration soon, which will help. Uh, but actually, DL4j in our in our proprietary stuff, we actually mainly use Kafka. So DL4j itself is actually so DL4j itself is actually standalone. So this doesn't rely on Spark. There's no Spark code in here. So this will run on your desktop. Um, so even you know even one of the um, even one of the neater things we have is this. Uh, yeah, for in the wild, I think this, yeah. So, I mean, even 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 like uh, the some of the other stuff we're doing. So we actually have a training GUI. Um, so so you can actually so you can actually this is called flow. This is something like flow where you can kind of monitor progress of different different layers, which is kind of cool. Um, we also have the neural net diagrams. This is all D three based, by the way. Um, we have the histograms. So you can actually model, model, monitor neural, net pro, ah, neural network progress in real time. Uh, and then this is all the deployment stuff, I think. And then, OK, yeah, Mesos. Uh, anyways, so what I, I guess what I'm getting at is this, this, none of this relies on Spark. This is all desktop. So we, we only use Spark really for training. And I, I highly advocate against using Spark's training. Um, you can if you want. I mean, you know, it, depend, it depends on your use case. but. Yeah, I mean, you, so we can integrate with that now as well, though. I said we can integrate with that now as well, though. So we mainly, so so we mainly use Kafka for a lot of our streaming stuff. So you, if you see the, I don't know if I have, I don't have a diagram right now, but um, basically, we for for streaming models, like what we do is we just we just subscribe to a Kafka topic and just we can just update models like that. Sorry. In memory, in memory, and occasionally to disk. That's all you got to do. So we um, we stand up models with something called Lagom. It's from it's from Lightbend. So Lagom, or the equivalent in Java world, is Spring. Another one is Spring Boot. Um, basically, basically we we embed it in a web stack, and then we do state management in the wrapper. I mean, we have something called a model serializer that you just got to do save, done, load save. Um, so you know, so our models are serialized. Our models are, are, are a mix of binary coefficients and JSON, basically. And then, so we just we can just say, occasionally save that to disk, and we're we're good to go. But a lot of it's in RAM. So I mean, that's that's why actually why I made DL4j the way I did was because it doesn't assume anything about the environment. It just knows about a matrix it's taking in and some it needs to output something. That's all. So we don't make any assumptions, but we decoupled it from the from Spark or any of the other streaming frameworks. We just made it embeddable. That was that was the solution was just to make it embeddable, because everybody has their own esoteric requirements. So. So, so arrow arrow is interesting. Arrow is a great way to represent data. So we want to use it for in memory col or the in memory columnar format. So we want to use that as a way of passing data around, kind of like protobuf. Is anybody using it? So. I, I don't think so. Uh, I think a lot of people are still well because it's it's just it's another it's it's it might be better, but it's a better it's just a it's a it's a it's an in-memory columnar format. You know, it's a very specialized use case. I think it, it's so Cloudera. I mean, Cloudera Cloudera is obviously going to drive adoption of this somehow, even if it's a brute force. They're going to use it because it was written by one of their engineers. So it'll happen at some point. I don't know when, but it's written by a lot of very smart people. I mean, I'm. Arrow is, a, Arrow is a favorite project of mine. I, I think it has a lot of potential. 
Especially, well, I mean, especially when you think about compression and just data representation in memory. You know, if you can, if, 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 if the idea of uh, store data in memory in a compressed format is, is, is in its own library, that actually gives you a lot of options for using it in applications. So I think the idea has potential, and I, and I think it'll, it'll catch steam, but I think it'll take, it'll take some time. I mean, m people didn't ab adopt protobuf immediately. They used REST for a long time, right? You know, so some people, they're starting to use protobuf because they need something faster. So that's kind of what, that's kind of what's happening now. It's just, it, it takes, it takes time to adopt that kind of stuff. It's very use case driven. Mm -hmm. I think that's, that's Good? We have for today. You, you be around. Yeah. Uh, so Martin, do you want to make an adoption? So thanks, um, and thank you.